Uh, welcome. I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive here at the British Library. Uh, we have many, many wonderful evenings here uh, in this lecture theatre, but this, I think, is one of the most special yet. Uh, a real, real privilege. Uh, one of the most exciting we've done of what's been a very, very rich programme of events to accompany Comics Unmasked, Art and Anarchy in the UK, open until the 17th of August. Please do tell all your friends. 19th of August. Two more days you've got to go and see it. Fantastic. Uh, we have, of course, uh, with us tonight two very special guests, Robert Crumb and Gilbert Shelton. Uh, and we are also shining a spotlight on uh, one of those moments uh, when it was actually Robert's work was slightly taken in vain or whatever happened. Unwittingly, at least, it found itself part of one of the great showdowns between the counterculture and the British establishment. Uh, the Oz... Magazine Obscenity Trial of 1971. Where were you when that happened? So uh, uh, these days, of course, both uh, Robert and Gilbert uh, live in France, so it's a fantastic privilege to have them both at our desk and table tonight. Uh, and many thanks to Laura Fountain and Tony Bennett for their help in making that happen. Uh, we have an evening of two halves. Uh, in the first half, uh, um, there will be a conversation chaired by uh, Charles Sharmari, who as well as being himself something of a legend of British journalism, music journalism, uh, was of course one of the school kids who were involved in the creation of this famous uh, magazine. Uh, and then in the second half, um, another of the school kids, uh, who's also gone on to different great things, the uh, head of the Design Museum, Dan Sujik, uh, will be uh, joining us in conversation uh, alongside Jeffrey Robertson, QC, who was uh, junior counsel at the time uh, on the, for the defence in the original trial uh, and subsequently wrote uh, a brilliant TV adaptation at the, uh, for the BBC uh, of everything that happened. Uh, and thanks, by the way, to Dick Pounton for stepping in as, as chair. Uh, I should say, because uh, it has to be said, and it's a sad thing to have to say, that we have, of course, one figure missing tonight, uh, who is Felix Dennis, uh, who was at the heart of the story. He was one of the editors of Oz, went on, of course, to a hugely influential career, not just in publishing, but many other things as well. Uh, his early and untimely death last month came as a shock to many, many people, uh, and I'm sure uh, we will all want to pay tribute to him tonight and indeed treat the evening as something of a tribute in itself. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, I do hope you enjoy the evening. Uh, if you haven't spotted the signed books out there, uh, there are many, and please do check them out afterwards. But it remains only for me to welcome to the stage uh, uh, to talk about uh, life and their work, uh, Robert Crumb, Gilbert Shelton, and Charles Sharmari. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to kick off by saying that it is a remarkable pleasure and privilege to be here with these two gentlemen. I've been an admirer, an appreciator, and a guffaw at their work since my teens, which, as you can tell, was quite a while ago. And, you know, what one of the many aspects of this, uh, this event now, which is fascinating, is both the parallels and the differences between probably the two finest and most influential cartoonists to emerge from the, uh, from the underground press explosion of the second half of the 60s in San Francisco, though neither of these gentlemen are actually from San Francisco. And also the fact that they both ended up completely independently moving to France, which is a place where they tell me artists are respected. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. So I'd like to, I'd like to commence by uh, asking both Gilbert and Robert, and I feel, uh, you know, a slight frisson at the fact that I'm actually addressing Mr. Crumb and Mr. Shelton by their first names. Uh, what, was, what was it, first of all, that drew each of you towards San Francisco? 
Robert? Uh, well, for me, I was in Cleveland working at a greeting card company and, uh, in 1966. And a friend of mine came back from San Francisco with some of these psychedelic posters for their rock concerts. And I could see, wow, these artists are taking LSD just like me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's something going on out there. I got to go out there. So about two weeks later, I just ran away. I had abandoned my first wife. My, I didn't tell anybody. I just went with these two guys that I met in a bar that were going to San Francisco that day, and I just went with them. <laughs> and I called my wife from San Francisco three weeks later and apologized that I'd <laughs> abandoned her without saying anything. And, and so she came out a few weeks later, and uh, that was in January 67. But you were, even though you were drawn to San Francisco by the psychedelicized environment, you were never yes. exactly a flowers in your hair kind of no, guy. No, I, I couldn't really do the whole hippie thing. I, I just didn't, I don't know, I was too inhibited, I guess. <laughs> I was too uptight. <laughs> but I took LSD and I, you know, I had my sympathies were, you know, with the hippie movement. You know, I was, had felt the same youthful optimism about the future and thought that you know if everybody took LSD and the world would blossom out and there'd be no more war or violence or greed or you know and that everything would be fine after all the old farts died off you know I kind of believed that too for a while briefly <laughs> <laughs> that, that idealism that level of you know flower child idealism didn't last very long about what six months maybe <laughs> that was about it and then came the revolution people started saying oh we got to like you know we got to get rid of these motherfuckers with violence. You know, the political power begins at the barrel of a gun, and da da da. That scared the shit out of the of power establishment. And then they—that's when they really started moving in with, you know, Cointel Pro and all this like secret, uh, you know, ways of undermining and <clears throat> and uh, weakening the whole thing because that it was starting to be seen as something dangerous. They really got scared at that point. And they very effectively kind of un did undermine it. They did, they did a good job of kind of killing it. But it was it, basically the, the hippies were not really up for, you know, risking their necks that much. It was, you know, nobody, very few people really willing to put themselves on the line to the extent that, like, the Black Panthers were, you know. Black Panthers really were put, put themselves on the line, you know. They hold up in houses in the ghetto with guns against the police. You know, very, very few hippies were really up for that. Said, well, what a bummer, man. Let's just go back to the land and, you know. <laughs> was your, uh, was it the same magnetism that drew you there, Gilbert? Not exactly. Uh, the, the music scene, yes. I, uh, there, there was a big contingent of Texas musicians there, uh, and I was living in Austin, Texas, and I thought maybe I could get a job doing rock and roll posters out there like uh, uh, Wes Wilson and Victor Muscoso and Rick Griffin yeah. and mm. Mouse and Kelly. Uh, I tried that too. I, they told me, well, we got enough poster artists. They would <laughs> anymore. And I, I thought I would go out for a couple of weeks and have a vacation from the Texas summer heat but I just stayed out there it was fun at the time and quickly uh, uh, I discovered that I wasn't going to make it as a poster artist and so I with some friends uh, started my own publishing company we published posters for a while and then we discovered Posters had to be nicely printed, and none of us knew how to run the printing press very well. <laughs> but comic books didn't need to be well printed, and uh, so uh, we... Oh, boy, the first few comics printed by Ripoff Press, oh, it was a travesty. <laughs> printing was atrocious. Oh, couldn't get that registration to save your life on, this, on the colors. Boy, it was bad. And, but you, and, both had a, a, you both had a greater affinity at that point for, uh, for narrative, uh, draw, uh, you know, because you were both weaned on the great, the great newspaper 
strips. Well, weaned on comic books, mostly. I you know, read Donald Duck, you know, Carl Barks' Donald Duck. I was, that was the thing I read as a kid. You know, we're children of pop culture, television, comics. You know, there was no high-class culture in, in, in my childhood at all. There were all these weekly left-wing newspapers at the time, and they were called underground newspapers. And I, I was more influenced by newspaper comics, uh, P Pogo Possum and, and Dick Tracy and Little Abner. And uh, I saw that these newspapers were, uh, I, I was in more or less sympathy with their point of view, but these newspapers were awfully dull. What, what they need is comic strips. <laughs> so, oh, the underground so, papers, yeah. Yeah, so a lot I, of bad writing polemics about, you know, yeah. you know, spiritual stuff or the revolution or whatever. But you're both in uh, your different ways. The, uh, you know, the the children of uh, Mad uh, Mad Magazine. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Disney and LSD. Yep, that's right. You got it. That's it. <laughs> oh, I wish I hadn't said that. You guys were supposed to say that. <laughs> Mad comics, not the mag later magazine. Yeah, but the, the, the first the, stuff. Yeah. Bill, Bill Elder, Jack Kurtzman, Davis. Yeah. The first Wally 24 Wood. issues were really a... Uh, comic book. Uh, it was a, I, I was influenced by that comic book. And, and I, uh, I liked Scrooge McDuck and Little Lulu... Yeah. Also. Yeah, great storytellers. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, in your separate ways, you both arrived at f uh, at fusing these influences with a left wing sensibility and the uh, and the, uh, the the psychedelic eruption. Yeah. How would you? I mean, I was okay. What? Let me ask you. You both. What kind of cartoonists do you think you might have been it, without psychedelics? How did psychedelics uh, and your experiences with psychedelics uh, transform you? I could, I, it'd be impossible to know <clears throat> how it would have turned out if I hadn't taken all that LSD. I have no idea. But, you know, in the early 60s, by the time I was like old enough to go out in the world and try and get some kind of career or job or something the, the comic scene was really pretty bleak there you know the the comics code had come in in the late 50s so was this the straight you know mainstream comic world was very restrictive because I was still thinking in terms of comic books you know and, but there was no there was no in anymore if you weren't doing like superhero comics or or the most romance comics bland, funny animal comics yeah bland Westerns. funny animal little Audrey you know it's it was there was not, nothing going on. So I, I kind of gave up the idea of, of even pursuing that, my childhood dream of being a comic book artist. I, I kind of decided that's, that's really not going to happen. <clears throat> so I you know, looked around for other things to do for a living. And then uh, the underground papers started, and I saw, wow, you know, it's, this is wide open. And I took LSD and stuff, and I had all these crazy visions in my head, and I was drawing in my sketchbook, drawing wacky comics, and suddenly you could get this stuff published and you know, didn't pay anything, but they would publish anything. There was but no did, censorship whatsoever. But didn't you begin by, uh, uh, by self-publishing? I mean, the iconic <coughs> image of you selling Zap comics oh, that, out of that the That actually came the after, after doing stuff for underground papers. Underground, doing pages, I mean, just, you know, it's like the old early days of newspaper comics where they give you a whole page in the comic, in the, Newspaper. You the know, Sunday, that would be the Sunday paper. feature. Yeah. And they, wow, I could do a whole page. Could, there was no money, as I said, but the, the, to the magic of senior work in print, wow. You know? And then, <laughs> obviously, some people seemed to like it. The hippies seemed to like it. So then I got this offer from an underground paper publisher. said, why don't you do a whole comic book? I'll publish a whole comic book. So then I set to work doing that Zap Comics number one. And uh, the rest is history. But the LSD that, you know, if I hadn't done that, that opened up this whole other, other world of utilizing these skills I'd learned as a kid, you know, and applying it to these visions. 
and you know, being part of that whole social movement of the time of all these other youths my age have, who had done the same thing, it, you know, it resonated, it spoke to them. You know, they could see that here was this wacky comic that actually reflects this LSD experience, this visionary experience. So I was kind of at the right place at the right time. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, did, you, did you have your first psychedelic experience before or after you created Wonder Warhol, Gilbert? After, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I don't think my uh, art and writing was much influenced by drugs. We, in Texas at the time, uh, we were eating peyote cactus, and that's <laughs> pretty, pretty much the same effect as LSD. You don't think that influenced your work? <laughs> uh, it, I'll, it made me see colors for the first time. I, it, oh, it, before eating peyote cactus, I thought red means stop and green means go. And, and then suddenly I saw that there was all these different the kinds colors, of red man, and different the, kinds of green. Look at the colors. <laughs> you must have been so frustrated working in black and white comics. No, I... Uh, or did you see them in color anyway? Well, it was a little bit frustrating because to do everything color was, was very expensive back then. So you had to kind of accept it. It's going to be black and white, except for the covers. You know, try. The, the drawing has to be better if it's black and white. To, yeah. The color makes it more uh, readable, more yeah. visible. And yeah. uh, so this, in that sense, uh, learning how to draw in black and white for these <laughs> underground weekly tabloid papers was very helpful to me. Uh, I was an art student too, and flunked out of the University of Texas for doing funny drawings and funny paintings in art class when they wanted us to do <laughs> abstract expressionism. That's right. That's what's dead serious abstract expressionism. <laughs> oh. I don't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> You're both renowned for characters that you've created with Gilbert, you know, his uh, most lasting impact has been with the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. Robert, your most lasting impact has been with a character called Robert Crumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. You are, uh, you know, your depiction... How embarrassing. <laughs> you uh <laughs> Your, depi your depiction of yourself, I would say, is uh, your ongoing depiction of yourself and your life, I would yeah. say, is something that will outlive uh, <laughs> Mr. Natural, Flaky yeah, Foon, Schumann so. the Human, and Fritz the Cat. that feline that Fritz the nobody Cat, really yeah. wants to talk about right. anymore. <laughs> Least of all me. <laughs> Huh. How, uh, I mean, Gilbert, you've occasionally appeared in, uh, like, prefaces and epilogues to your stories, but, you know, you, uh, you know, if, if you appear as a character, then you're speaking through the other characters, but, Robert, how did, how did you, uh, after, you know, creating uh, characters who were pretty well-liked and well-received... Yeah. Uh, what uh, what what led what led you to the, the extraordinary ongoing uh, autobiography, which has been <coughs> the dominant strain of your work for uh, the last so many decades? Well, uh, I got tired of doing the same those characters over and over again, Mister Natural, and all that. I got tired of that, and then also I got hitched up with Aileen. Her comics were totally autobiographical. My wife down here, <laughs> she couldn't do anything but autobiographical comics. So that living with her, I kind of got inspired to put myself more and more just as the as the character. In my comics, it seemed kind of a I don't know a natural way to to go, just to do it directly about yourself. And then you know I did a lot of collaborations with her too, and that that was very easy to do because you know she's kind of. <laughs> Uh, natural born 
Jewish sort of Don Rickles, Joan Rivers kind of a joke teller. So it was, the, this is the bad influence of the crumbs. Uh, they, they, their stuff is interesting, but they've inspired so many inferior cartoonists to do autobiography <laughs> that you know, it's boring stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we can't blame Bob Dylan for all those bad lyrics written by other people or Hendrix for all those terrible guitar no, solos. I just blame Woody Guthrie people. for Bob Dylan. That's <laughs> <laughs> ah, but who do we blame it's for all Woody right, Guthrie? All right, Ma, I'm only bleeding, please. <laughs> oh, that's poetry. <laughs> poetry, that's right. He's a poet. Another... D I, guess, I guess another sense in which you know the parallel aspect of your careers has strongly diverged is that I got the impression of Gilbert as being comfortable within certain aspects of the counterculture with which you Robert are notoriously uncomfortable I mean Gilbert as far as I know actually likes some uh, some music recorded since 1937 <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's that's true. I, I never liked that music. I, he was talking about going to San Francisco because of the music. I did not find any of that music very interesting that was going on. That it's psychedelic rock and roll with guys endlessly noodling on their electric guitars for, you know, for hours. Jesus, please. I went to the Avalon Ballroom and the, you know, the strobe lights and the noodling guitars, it just put me to sleep. I remember falling asleep on this couch and waking up hours later, hey, we're closing up, get out of here. <laughs> there, there was a few exciting acts. Both of us knew Janis Joplin and... Yeah, but Jan you know, I liked the stuff she did she, back in Austin better than the stuff <laughs> she did with Big Brother. When she was doing that more kind of folky stuff, I liked that better. Yeah, she was... Uh, she asked... Robert to do the the famous uh, Columbia record album cover, right? The Cheap Thrills cover, yeah. and the, and the cover that Robert did was supposed to be the back cover, yeah. and uh, <laughs> they didn't like the front cover. And the front did. cover was a picture, of, a portrait of Janice with sweat flying. No, off no, no, of... no. That's that's not right. The front oh, no. cover I did. I took photos of all the people in the band, and then. I made little cartoon bodies on them and put them on a stage. They didn't, they didn't like it. I never saw it again. I don't know what happened to it. They didn't like it, so they used that back cover for the front. And then that other that image of Janice with the sweat popping off her, that was done for uh, some paper in Cleveland. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that might have been too much for Columbia also. That, that's the story that I heard. I think the, the band didn't like it, that's what I think. <laughs> but the, the Columbia had some other idea. They came to me like at the last minute to do that cover because Columbia had made them all like get in a bed together and take some stupid, you know, idea that these businessmen had about hippies. You know, and they went along with them. They saw the image that they were really embarrassed, so they came to me and said, "Well, can you do us a cover and have it done by tomorrow morning, <laughs> so we can, you know, send it to New York?" And so I took some amphetamine and you know pulled a all nighter on that and got it done. Big money, 600 bucks. That's big money in those days. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw the artwork again. You know, you think about getting the artwork back. And then later I found out it was sold for $21,000. <laughs> who buy and who to? And then somebody sold it after that for like $100,000. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. I, don't, <laughs> I, I did all right. I, you know, I live well. <laughs> you also did the lettering for Janice's first solo album, but you turned down the stones. Yeah, look, I forget, somebody approached me about, so agent of theirs or something about doing a cover. I, had, I don't, didn't like them, I hated them actually. Hated the stones. <laughs> Goodbye, Ruby Tuesday. <laughs> Not one of their finest moments, I'll agree, yeah. but. No, actually, that was one of their better songs. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only way to be. That's kind of melodic. It's all right. Okay, bootleggers, roll that one. <laughs> Robert Crumb sings Jagger and Richard. <laughs> Exclusive. Hey, live. With my, with, with my banjo. <laughs> <laughs> or your ukulele or your mandolin. Right. <laughs> Can you imagine how embarrassing? <laughs> 
Oh, jeez. Well, I guess that is it then. We're off. No, <laughs> no we've got, we got, we got a ways to go yet, gentlemen. <laughs> by okay. Some, Gilbert, by some strange coincidence, arrived in the post a few days ago a CD by Lightning Hopkins called Freeform Patterns, which I'm personally still trying to get my head around the implied contradiction. If it's free form, can it be a pattern and vice versa? Free form but it was patterns. It was recorded in and around the Vulcan Gas Company. I was the art director for the Vulcan Gas Company. I did some posters for Lightning Hopkins. What was the Vulcan Gas Company? It was a music venue in Austin, Texas. Oh. It would hold about 400 people. Huh. No air conditioning. It was really miserable in there on a summer night. So what years was this? Uh, 57, 58. Oh, my God, that's ancient history. I, I mean, no, 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 67, oh. 68, sorry. And Johnny Winter's Progressive Blues Experiment album was recorded there without an audience during the daytime. It's still one of his best records. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Winter's... Uh, our, uh, the owner of the Vulcan Gas Company discovered Johnny Winters and he asked him to d come do a gig at the Vulcan Gas Company. And Johnny Winters said, uh, give me six months, I'm not good enough yet. Wow, <laughs> jeez. A, mo That's a modest man. Wow. Uh, but, you know, you do, you do crop up in the, uh, in the liner notes to this, in the little, this little history of the Vulcan... Uh, Vulcan Gas Company that goes along with the Lightning Hopkins stuff. And it says here that some of the people around there were the real-life Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. <laughs> it says they create... Uh, although he, meaning Mr Shelton here, has maintained that the characters, and <coughs> the characters are an amalgam, Fat Freddy was an almost direct depiction of Fat Charlie Pritchard. Is Phineas that, that distinctly <laughs> resembles Houston White, while Free William Franklin shared a surname with Vulcan poster artist Jim Franklin. Is, uh, is, is this simply slander, or is there any, uh, any, um, any truth in any of that? Oh, not really. Uh, uh, Fat Charlie had, had a good name and, and great hair. <laughs> he might have been an inspiration, uh, it, but it's the characters I designed mainly to, with my limited drawing ability to have three characters that you could distinguish between among the three. A, a, a lot of comic strips confuse me because I can't recognize the characters. So I made them exaggeratedly different. Kind of like the Three Stooges. Or the Marx Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, the Freak Brothers are sort of a combination of the Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges. <laughs> and the cat is a combination of every cat, that, every Tom cat that's ever lived. There was a, an American comic strip, Mutt and Jeff, and it, at the bottom of the page was a little filler comic strip to fill up the page if it was the longer format of newspaper called Cicero's Cat. And uh, mm. I, I loved Cicero's Cat when I was a kid reading the comics. So I, Cicero's Cat sort of had a human face like Cicero. And so uh, Fat Freddy's cat has the same nose as Fat Freddy, the same eyes and nose. And of course, Fat Freddy's cat doesn't have a name. He's just Fat Freddy's cat. People occasionally call him by saying, hey, Fat Freddy's cat. Yeah, or they think he's Fat Freddy. You, you know, T.S. Eliot's verse, the, the naming of cats is a serious matter. It isn't just one of your everyday names. I, you may think that I'm as mad as a hatter when I tell you that each cat has three different names. <laughs> And he goes on to say, the, the first name is the name that the humans call it, and the second name is the name that the other cats call it, and the third name is his secret name, and that's why the cat has a, always has a smile on his face. He's contemplating his 
secret, ineffable, effing ineffable name. <laughs> hey, who, sa who said that we weren't going to get some high culture? <laughs> you know, it, um, in with in, um, in with all this stuff about sex, drugs, rock and roll, and re um, and revolution, Gilbert. I guess, I mean, okay. Just to preface it, if if the fabulous furry freak brothers have been real people, by now they would either be dead, in jail, in hospital, uh, or <coughs> other or otherwise incapacitated by their lifestyle, which. We do not recommend for teenagers and other living things. Right, right. But don't, don't try this at home. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend LSD to anyone, really. No, even if even if it will even if it will transform you into a genius. Well, it's a Faustian deal, you know. You you might have visions, but you also might kind of be mentally crippled for about 25 years, <laughs> as I was, but, <laughs> and probably still am. I'm it was that. noted that it wouldn't necessarily transform you. It would just make you more like you were before. If you gave LSD to a cop, he would just become super cop. <laughs> <laughs> well, were, th in the, were some, at least the earlier and less uh, phantasmagorical adventures of the brothers based on events which may have occurred to people you knew? <laughs> well, there was one story. We're past the statute of limitations. <clears throat> Mostly fiction, but there was one supposedly true story that was told to me by Edwin Bud Schrake about going out stoned in New York City one night and he was accosted by two muggers and they told him, give us all your money. And he was stoned. He said, well, I've got some money in my pocket and I've got some money at home in the sugar bowl and I've got a bank account uh, with money in it. And, and, but the bank's not going to be open until Monday. So, so he said to the muggers, nope, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they ran off. <laughs> Did you put that in a comic strip? That's yeah. great. Yeah, it was, great. Fin uh, it was Phineas, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Great. great. But, but Bud Shrake is a big guy. That might have had something to do with chasing off the muggers when he said, nope. <laughs> did, he, did he give him the money in his pocket? No. Oh. Huh. Hmm. So, um, so it all, um, so it all ended, ended happily then. Um, it's with uh, with with the subject matter that you've uh, both incorporated into your into your cartoons and and artworks. Have you re have you received uh, legal complications? Co uh, confrontations with authority and people who just thought that what you were doing was not nice? <clears throat> well, I got a lot of criticism from the feminists for a while in the 70s and 80s. They were kind of really down on my twisted sexual fantasies. <laughs> but, uh, otherwise, you know, yeah, you, well, it's like you get a bad review, but, it's, you know, mostly that people either liked it or they left it alone. Because you've never, you've never exactly courted mainstream popularity. Right? No, I don't care about that. I don't care about the mainstream. I never was interested in that. I wouldn't compromise myself to get more readers. And you know, I worked for the New Yorker for a while and did collaborations with Aileen. But even in that, you know, there's a, enough of a compromise so it's not something I would, uh, you know, depend on for my whole career I wouldn't just that's too much compromise is that in a sense uh, an important part of the legacy of underground of underground cartooning that each um, each piece each piece of work is the result of an individual sensibility or uh, a very tight collaboration between yeah. a very small uh, small number of people 
Yeah, well, there's certainly a high degree of individuality in those comics, and you look at, you know, the, the spectrum of all the stuff that was done in the 70s and into the 80s. Boy, there's some crazy stuff, and the miracle that it got printed, some of it. And some of it's unreadable. I went back a, about a year ago, and I went through my collection of underground comics from the 70s, and I think about 75% of it was really unreadable. <laughs> These people were so stoned, it's like incoherent. You know, what the fuck are they <laughs> trying to do here? You can't, you know, incomprehensible is they're just, they didn't know how to get out of their, their own, like, you know, psychedelicized mind enough to actually do anything communicable. It's a lot of it. But still, it's interesting, and all, history will sort it all out, you know, what what value it really has. I don't know, maybe there was too much freedom, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Excessive indulgence in, you know, people's own personal fantasies. Who knows That's how, you know, what value ultimately that has culturally, I don't know. In the, in, in the intervening years, I mean, obviously, you know, you've both been doing this a while. Yeah. Uh, you, you've both worked on, you know, the art, um, the art, and uh, and the craft. I mean, when you when you sit when you sit down at your respective drawing um, drawing boards now, <coughs> yeah. Uh, do you um, do you do you feel that you uh, you know you 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 have chops now that you sure. could have used when uh, when you were young guys starting out? I just definitely feel like my Drawing skills have improved, but you know, just a level of, of virtuosity or skill is not the whole story. Obviously, you know, if there's if you have really something that you just gotta say, gotta get it out, and that there's a lot of intense, you know, spirit behind it. That's much more important than a level of skill. You know, I think, but skill certainly helps to to get an idea across. But you know, some people. It's all skill, it's all technique, and not much content, not much uh, of interest. So, you know, I would prefer something that's crudely drawn or even crudely played musically that has some kind of a f authentic feeling behind it than something that's very, uh, you know, with a lot of virtuosity and skill that's, that's not, that has really not much interesting to say. But that's like the merit of, say, old. Uh Old time blues or punk rock, where you know the <coughs> the you know the degree the it's the quality uh, it's the quality of the vision and the commitment to it uh, that that counts. But with some of the work you've done, uh, you know, in the latter part of your career, I'm yeah. thinking of like the <coughs> the Genesis, um, right. you know, several of the classic comic adaptations. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in term that I mean, in terms of classicist illustration, mm -hmm. you know that uh, you know there's extraordinary, um, extraordinary stuff there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, my skills have definitely improved over the years, but the early stuff has that kind of spontaneous, wacky, youthful freshness to it that you know that just doesn't last forever. <laughs> you, know, you, you, uh, you get battered around by life, and you get cynical, and you get sick and tired of the whole all the bullshit and so that kind of you know but I mean for both for both of you it's uh, it's got to be you know the you know the vision the vision that drives you now because you know in olden in olden days you uh, you know undoubtedly having at certain points to crank to pay the rent but it's got um, still got to do that <laughs> But I mean, it's you know, it, you know, it's the, uh, you know, the, it's the art, you know, the artistic urge ro uh, rather than the, you know, uh, <coughs> than the oh shit, look at this pile of bills thing. Well, you're always driven by fear of you know poverty to some extent. You know, you always that's part of, always part of the motivation. Always was, <laughs> you know, fear of you got to survive in this world somehow. If I can't draw, what am I going to do? You know. Mow lawns, what? I don't, can't do anything else. But and and, and you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting down drawing now, it's the same as it always was. This part of me saying, "What the fuck are you doing?" Now? I don't even. I know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if it's 
what I did before was better or whether this is an improvement or whether it's inferior. I never know. I, never, I didn't know 30, 40 years ago. It's, it's always a kind of probing in the dark, you know. You're just kind of done, you know. I don't know. Gilbert, un, unless you've been misquoted, you once said the... The Freak Brothers will be immortal as long as you can still hold a pencil. You never said that. <laughs> I, I don't remember. It. That's not you. I don't remember saying anything like that. I, I might have, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, do you, st do you still retain uh, retain affection for the uh, you know for these three wasters and their scabby pet? Well, it's a literary gimmick. Uh, uh, group of three to uh, as a comedy team it, and it uh, it's unusual and it works well <clears throat> I, uh, at the University of Texas we had a monthly humor magazine and I became the editor of the humor magazine and, and became infatuated about the idea of humor what is, what is this magic thing that makes people laugh Laugh out loud. So I always wanted to be a laugh out loud <coughs> humorist, and uh, it it has there's tricks to it. I wasn't all that good at it, it uh, even now, but I uh, I know when something is funny when it makes me laugh. So that's uh, <coughs> but I'm still looking for funny stories. That's where I first saw your stuff was in that Texas Ranger. Mm. I was working at the greeting card place. They used to get that those college humor magazines to steal jokes for the greeting cards. <laughs> <laughs> when I first saw your work in there. Yeah, you have um, you you've said that those greeting cards you did for what, what was the company again? American Greetings. Um, yeah, in Cleveland. Cleveland, yeah. That you know some of them some of them are still out there, and That's people right. are looking at them and going, "Wow, the art in that looks amazingly like crumbs." Yeah. <laughs> So we were never allowed to sign them, of course. You know. I lived in Cleveland, Ohio for a while, too, and I went to American Greeting Cards Company and applied <coughs> for a job that I, I wasn't good enough no for. <laughs> really? Wow, yeah. you did. Weren't good enough? Jesus, they, they, no, they seemed no. to me they'd hire anybody up the <laughs> <laughs> They had, like, hundreds of artists that were just oh, so so bad, most of them, They're, you know, it was the lowest paying art job imaginable. But even that, I was, I felt so grateful I actually had an art job, it was a miracle. <laughs> Cleveland was a really depressing town, though, boy. It's, it's funny, you're not the only person I've heard say that. What, about Cleveland? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty grim, it's pretty grim. So it's like, places just divided up into these hostile ethnic groups that all hate each other. It's, you know, so that's why they put the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there. It's bizarre. And that's where Siegel and Schuster, uh, they were so anxious to get out, they had to create a flying guy. Right. <laughs> Cleveland. I think it's even worse now than it was back in the, when I lived there. <clears throat> so with your, uh, with your current uh, eminence and the Olympian Heights mm, there Yes. Are, <laughs> of course. <laughs> do you uh, do you do you still check out what uh, what younger artists oh, do, yeah. um, are sure. doing? Do you still sort of keep up with the field, or do you just go? I do what I do. That's no, it. no, I, I I'm still I still love comics, and I always looking to see what's going on in the comics. See if there's anything interesting going on. And now with you know the graphic novel thing that's going on. And yeah, how do, you feel, how, being, how do you feel about graphic, the graphic novel? Well, thing? people are taking comics much more seriously than, than they ever did when I was a kid. Or when I was young, comics were the lowest form of you know, culture there was. A comic artists in the 50s, I heard that when they were at cocktail parties, somebody said, well, what do you do? They would say, oh, I'm an illustrator. They would admit they drew comics. It was so embarrassing. Uh, you know? I would say, I'm in the publishing business. <laughs> <laughs> I would, in the back in those days, in the 60s, I would tell girls I was trying to impress that I drew comics, and they'd say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, but now it's a big, serious, high art form, and there's, like, critics and everything, you know? So it's kind of the kiss of death, really, so. <clears throat> and there's a lot of really pretentious comics being done now. Very pretentious, and, you know, bam. 
throw it at. But there's still kids coming up doing great, funny stuff. There's a young guy called Aaron Lang in, in the U.S. He's, he lives in Philadelphia. I think he's, you know, really lives on the skids, but he does these little pamphlet things that he puts out there. They're hilarious. They're really funny. There's always, you know, once in a while somebody comes up like that, still doing good stuff. Anybody caught your eye, Gilbert? I'm out of touch uh, with the current scene. I, I read French comics uh, in the monthly magazines, mainly to study my French, to learn French. <laughs> Are you aware of David Surdrill, that French cartoonist? Who, who? He's the greatest, David Surdrill. No, I don't know that one. I think he's a guy in his 40s. He's, his drawing keeps improving. Beautiful drawing. that he's, He uses himself as the main character, and he's this nerdy loser guy. And, I wonder and, where he got that idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, cartoonists generally are nerdy losers. That's just, just the way it is. You sit at home and drawing all the time. It's, and it's, you know... Instead of being out in the fresh air. Yeah. It's, you sit in your room and look at comics and draw comics, it's, it's, it, you know. I mean, back when I was young, anything but a comic artist was more exciting and romantic to girls, a poet, an oil painter, or you're writing a novel, or, you know, anything was more interesting and exciting than drawing comics. <laughs> now it's a little bit different, you know, girls actually come to comic conventions now, it's incredible. In costume sometimes, yeah. I'm told. That's yeah, right, they dress I, I like was Wonder a, Woman. The, I saw a few Wonder Women yesterday at the oh, yeah? at the London yeah. uh, exhibition, and all <laughs> kinds of characters that uh, I didn't recognize. Right. Uh, it, it, cute young teenage girls in their sexy costumes. <laughs> Maybe someone someone will do an ironic uh, revival of Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. <laughs> That'd be nice, <laughs> but all the superhero stuff is still comes out that just this constant river of this superhero action adventure comics that to me are utterly and completely uninteresting. I have no interest in that stuff at all. <coughs> or manga, I can't I no can't get up for that at all. No, but just the you know the quirky individualistic stuff is what what I always look for. Did you guys ever check out the Hernandez brothers? Yeah, Love and yeah, Rockets, Heartbreak stuff. Soup. Yeah. Yeah, that's Good stuff, yeah. and uh, uh, Dan Klaus, great. Heine Hermandis <laughs> is one of the great uh, figure oh, artists yeah. of uh, oh, yeah. uh, of all the cartoonists. Those both and, of those guys can really he, draw the human Be figure. Beto is a great story writer and a fairly good artist too. <laughs> yeah. So can uh, can your respective panting publics? get any kind of uh, hint of what we can expect from from you in the future, sneak, pre sneak previews of, uh, uh, or, as, or as we call it, advance hype. Can expect on me working, to retire soon, any day now. Work in progress. <laughs> Out of here. I won't leave the stage for the younger kids. They can take over. <laughs> Had my day. A lot of ink has gone under the bridge. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I've always had trouble drawing, and now my eyes are going. Yeah. And, uh, I got arthritis, a lot of pain. <laughs> and, uh, I had this, this uh, retrospective exhibit at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Paris a couple of years ago. And boy, they, they did a good job of gathering up old work of mine from all these sources. And they said, rooms and rooms of my drawings. Said, Jesus Christ, I've done so much drawing in my life. It's enough already. You <laughs> can retire, relax. You don't have to keep doing this. You can Jesus, just you know, relax and listen to your records and you know, go out and take a walk. Huh? Take care of the grandkids. Yeah, yeah I want take care of the grandchildren. And then draw once in a while. I still like to draw once in a while. I still feel like my life is meaningless unless I do some drawing once in a while. I'm, I'm nothing, I'm nobody unless I'm, sure. unless I'm drawing. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Is that Joan? Where would I be without her? I'd be dead without her. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> okay. Oh, 
Well, all I, um, all I can say is it's been a pleasure, a privilege and an honour to sit here with these gentlemen. I mean, I've identified in, with them in different ways for a long time. Uh, it's for only a long comic time. books, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's comic books. Let's not get too, you know, heavy about it. Well, you know, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I like drugs and I like cats, so I've... <laughs> Bom uh, empathised with Mr. Shelton. Uh, I like muscular women and old blues oh, records, so right, okay. I bonded uh, All right. uh, with with Mr. With Mr. Crumb. You're, let's you're my hope, bro. Let's hope we. <laughs> let's hope it isn't true that we will, will not see their uh, their like again. Because as far as I'm concerned, both of these gentlemen have blazed trails for the cartoonists of the future. And fucking a. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I want to see more. I, I want to see more of the kind of work that would not have been possible without them, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Gilbert Shelton and Mr. Robert Crum. Okay, we're now going to proceed to. I'm getting instructions via my earpiece here. OK, we're now going to move on to the second part of our programme where we're going to be looking at uh, the, the roots and branches of the Oz School Kids issue and the Oz Conspiracy Trial. And your host for this portion of the evening will be Mr Dick Pounson. And, joining, and also joining us on stage will be my fellow Oz school kid, though unlike me, he's learnt how to dress like a grown-up, Mr. Dayan Sujik. <laughs> and one of the guys who actually defended us, or rather, defended the editors, I personally was not charged, in court, the distinguished human rights lawyer, Mr. Jeffrey Robertson. <laughs> Take, take it away and burn it. Well, uh, first of all, I should explain that I'm here as a substitute for my dear old friend, Felix Dennis, who died last month. We'd worked together for 40 years, and uh, I'm, I lack one of his qualifications, and I was not in the dock at the Old Bailey, though I did work on Oz magazine. Um, Oz Magazine came to London in 1967, which was the year that the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper, and the year that I scored my first acid trip in the bar in LSE. <laughs> um, the magazine started off as a satirical student magazine in Australia, but in 1966, Richard Neville, Jim Anderson, and Martin Sharp decided they needed a bigger pond. They moved it to London, which was becoming a center of the international counterculture alongside San Francisco and Amsterdam. And they found the bigger pond. They found a rock and roll business overflowing with money. They brought a couple of talented graphic designers, Martin Sharp and John Goodchild, and they transformed their magazine into the best psychedelic magazine in Europe. It looked marvellous, it had great writers, and it had a remarkably libertarian editorial policy. Now and again, they would just hand an issue over to a guest editor or a guest group they had uh, an issue, uh, gay activists edited an issue. They handed an issue over to feminists. And so it came about that in issue 26, they invited fifth form and sixth form school children who would like to edit a magazine about their grievances to come in and do exactly that. We have two of those people on the 
stand here tonight. There's, Charles there's two more in the uh, second row here. Actually. Two yes. more in the second row. The outcome of that, we all... We're on our writing for the independent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what they grew up to do. It, the, they came in and they did the issue, which was issue 28. One of the things that they did was what nowadays would be called a mash-up. They took one of Robert's cartoons and they spliced the head of Rupert the Bear, who was a very wholesome family cartoon from the Daily Express, onto the body of a particularly rampant and well-endowed character of Robert's. That cartoon caught the eye of the law. The Oz officers were raided, the editors were arrested, and so began the longest obscenity trial in British legal history to that point. And sitting here, we have the man who defended them in that trial, eventually got them out of jail. So, Charles, how did, did you and the other kids know each other at all before you saw that issue of ours? Well, I, ra I rounded up a posse of uh, kids from my school and a nearby girls' school and was going, this looks like fun, let's go. I mean, technically, uh, I think it said something about you know, 18 and under, but I was prepared to lie about my age. I was about to turn 19, but I thought this is a good way to avoid having to become a librarian or a civil servant. And I'd been, I'd graduated from reading rock papers to reading the underground press. And from what, as far as I could gather, what these guys in London were doing was leading the sort of life I thought I should be leading. They, uh, you know, they, they, were they were causing plenty of inventive cultural trouble. Uh, they, they appeared to have attractive girlfriends and they were taking a metric fuck ton of drugs. And I thought, I'd like some of that. So I said, hey, let's go up, let's do this. And we all ended up in Richard Neville's basement uh, in Palace Gardens Terrace. Yeah, that's right. uh, and, you know, met all the uh, contemporaries and those a bit younger who'd come for pretty much the same reasons we did and met the Oz editors. I recall Richard as being, uh, you know, very loose and charming and floppy haired. And I guess it uh, shouldn't have come as any surprise many years later that he was played on the TV adaptation by a young Hugh Grant. <laughs> Jim Anderson was very tall and very skinny with lank blonde hair and resembled a sort of healthy version of, comparatively healthier version of Johnny Winter. He was the first out gay man I'd ever met. And then there was Felix, the freak with a briefcase in his chocolate brown prince, uh, chocolate brown pinstripe suit uh, with his Charles II hair and pirate's beard and... Uh, deafening guffaw and the key thing was that contrary to what the legal establishment attempted to make out later you know they didn't attempt to force us into doing saying or writing anything they were genuinely interested in what we want to do is that how you remember it Dan? Vividly. Um, I remember that brown suit. I remember Felix, um, who strangely had an episode at the same school that I had previously been at. He claimed to be expelled. Um, he, of course, he wasn't an editor in those days. He was the advertising salesman. That's why he had the suit. And the reviews editor. And, mm. yeah, the business manager. I suppose I remember it being something that you went into really lightly. Um, it seemed so benign. It was, about, it was a very sunny summer in London. Um, and it seemed so shocking when this very light thing suddenly turned into this really horrible thing of people being sent to jail, um, of uh, school kids being lined up either to give evidence against or for them. Um, it just seemed so unlikely. It just seemed so uh, different from what we were expecting, I suppose. Um, it was only a magazine. 
and yet it produced all those insights into Britain. Um, I think one of the most shocking things was the judge who suggested that uh, Felix will get a shorter sentence than the others because he hadn't been to university. And <laughs> that's being... <laughs> the other thing that also genuinely in my innocence shocked me was of course the reaction to young women who, from young women who saw that issue and were horrified by what was seen as being a gross piece of sexism. And that's also part of the climate. I mean, the words jailbait have rather different um, tenor these days, don't they? Jeff, what, what were they actually charged with? Well, they were charged, uh, the book was thrown at them, they were charged, would you believe, with conspiracy to corrupt public morals by debauching the morals of young children within the realm. And uh, that was the first charge, and that carried life imprisonment. <laughs> Seriously, and they would have gone to jail for many, many years if they'd been convicted of that. And the, our great success, our great uh, thing during the trial was to have them acquitted of that. Then there was obscenity, which was a charge that this magazine uh, depraved and corrupted those likely to read it. And thirdly, there was the pathetic little charge of sending an indecent magazine through the post. <laughs> so this was, but there was more to it than that. The magazine actually had been, uh, the first complaint to the police, the only complaint to the police, was from the General Secretary of the National Union of Teachers, because this had been found passing around. But it was that, that receded because that wasn't the reason they were prosecuted. This was 1971. This was almost revenge for the 60s in the 70s under a new conservative government. Uh, you have to understand that part of the corruption of the time was the police force. The obscene publication squad, the dirty squad, was dealing pornography by arrangement with the Soho pornographers. You could get the most extreme pornography uh, just by asking in Soho because Paul Raymond and others were paying off the police. Uh, the drug squad was uh, dealing drugs and the serious crime squad was setting up serious crime. <laughs> Scotland, Yard, <laughs> Scotland Yard was utterly corrupt before Robert Mark came in in 73. And as a result, uh, the 18 members of the Dirty Squad were all sent to prison, convicted of running a massive uh, protection racket in Soho. These were the people who then raided Oz. I'll never forget, uh, in Berwick Street, they walked up three rickety blocks of stairs to knock on the door of the garret of nasty tales and arrest three stone cartoonists whom they, <laughs> they dragged to trial just after Oz. So this war on the underground press was partly, as far as the police were concerned, to protect their cover. They were protecting and making enormous amounts of money from the des most desolatingly ugly porn that was being sold in Soho, uh, and yet to pretend to Lord Longford and Mary Whitehouse and the politicians of the time that they were actually doing something, they were uh, starting these prosecutions for conspiracy uh, of the underground press. And uh, in the summer of 1971, uh, we were all there in the Old Bailey. And the three main exhibits were, firstly, Robert's uh, uh, Rupert the Bear. Huh? Yes, modified by Viv Berger by putting the much-loved iconic nursery figure of Rupert uh, on the, the head of the bear. And this was, I think, there's something touched the British establishment. We couldn't get a QC <laughs> to defend this magazine. Would you believe uh, the, the Labour QC MP, who had been originally briefed, 11 days before the trial actually opened his brief, saw that and, and refused to act. <laughs> then I went to Basil Wigader, who defended Rudi Deutschka, uh, a really brilliant liberal reputation. He accepted, had a conference, 
uh, at which Jim Anderson, I think, mentioned possibly the Chicago conspiracy trial and throwing something in court. And he rang up a few hours later and said he couldn't take the risk. Couldn't take the risk of, of not becoming chairman of Booper, as I think he eventually <laughs> became. And so we were there, Ford, on the Friday before the trial started on Monday, without a QC. So Richard and I heard that John Mortimer was defending an axe murderer at the Old Bailey and was having lunch with his uh, very young companion of 22 years, uh, whom he later married. And so we plucked up courage and we took uh, the magazine down to the, the restaurant and uh, opened it to show him Rupert. And he giggled. <laughs> he actually giggled. And when so did his uh, uh, companion. And so he said, uh, oh, goody, can I defend? <laughs> and uh, so we, I just have to finish my axe murderer because <laughs> the bloodstains aren't running our way. So uh, that is how uh, we did at least uh, get a defender. I wasn't a counsel. I was just, I was a student at Oxford, actually, uh, who'd written for Oz in Australia and uh, was writing a, a thesis on conspiracy to corrupt public morals. So uh, we then began this extraordinary six-week trial, which featured some of the greatest intellects in the country as defense witnesses. We had the Oxford professor of jurisprudence, Ronnie Dworkin. We had Professor Hans Einzig, the leading psychiatrist, Edward de Bono, Marty Feldman, Felix Topolsky, who came forward to defend um, Robert's work. Um, we had John Peel, who we had to call to defend Charles Shah Murray, who'd written a review that mentioned, uh, I think, the word fuck music, and uh, was grilled in the Old Bailey by the prosecuting counsel. Um, uh, have you ever heard of a symphony by Beethoven uh, be inducing an orgasm? Uh, to which John said, in his inimitable way, he said, uh, well, I haven't, but I, if I wrote music, I'd like to think someone was making love to it. <coughs> I notice you use making love instead of fuck. Why is that? Well, John said, I, I've used making love because I've been a courtroom. <laughs> but, but, but since everyone else is saying fuck, then I'll say it too. <laughs> and... Uh, when this Charles's review was put to some psychiatrist, and he said, what do you think about using this word? Fuck music. And the psychiatrist said, well, I think Shakespeare put it rather better, didn't he? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I was only young. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and so it went on and uh, provided entertainment uh, for many until over six weeks, as I say, of, uh, of the summer. Um, and constantly, the, 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 it was packed. It was like a theatre because all the American lawyers would come. And uh, we had characters like George Melly, the great George Melly, who was, uh, uh, I remember Judge Argyle leaning over to him and saying, um, what do you, uh, for the benefit of those of us without a classical education, what do you mean by this word cunnilinctus? <laughs> I think he was pronouncing it like it was a cough medicine. And, uh, and George beamed. He, he actually thought he'd made connection here. He said, oh, my Lord, I'm so sorry. I've been inhibited by the architecture. And Lord, uh, sucking or blowing or going down or gobbling. Or in my naval days, your Lordship, we called it yodeling in the canyon. <laughs> So, uh, the, 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 everyone laughed. This is a courtroom, not a theatre. <laughs> Kept was the judge's constant. He used to look at Rupert's erection through a magnifying glass. <laughs> and, quite seriously, and when, when I did a play, which was actually a verbatim transcripts, it was first put on by the great late Buzz Goodbody at uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company at the place. And uh, with... Uh, the judge, I think Leslie Phillips played him. And um, I, I said to Buzz, look, you've taken out my direction to have the judge look at Rupert's uh, erection through a magnifying glass. And she said, yes, she said, uh, I have. I said, but that happened. And she said, it happened in court, but in a theater, the 
public won't believe that it happened. <laughs> so there were extraordinary events, many of them, and uh, it was uh, an extraordinary time. The um, jury acquitted on the conspiracy to corrupt public morals charge, which was an enormous relief because Argyle was mad and would have sent them down for many years. They convicted on the obscenity charge, which I was quite happy with because the judge was an idiot and actually had given them the wrong direction on obscenity. He said obscenity meant indecency, which it doesn't in law. So we were confident we had that in the bag. And they convicted, of course, on indecency, which we expected, so uh, which wasn't a serious offence. So um, then, would you believe, the judge decided to remand them in prison for psychiatric examination. They were stark, staring sane, and yet here they were, like in Russia at the time, being carted off to prison for, to have their heads read. But more than that, to have their heads shaven. It suddenly, <laughs> the Daily Mail discovered and did a front page. This is all front page stuff. While well, three million people were being killed in the genocide in Bangladesh at this very time, uh, it was all Oz trial. There were more letters to the Times about the Oz trial than there had been about the Suez crisis. But what was really hit the headlines was the fact that they were having their head, their head shorn because they all had long hair, of course, hippie style. And so the cultural collision that was the Oz trial was, it seemed to be summed up in this atavistic prison policy that the minute you got into prison, you had your head hair shaved off. And uh, so it was a, a nervous time. They spent uh, a week in prison before we got them out on bail and uh, inevitably uh, won the appeal because the judge had misdirected the jury 78 times. <laughs> And that, so it had a happy ending, unless you think that its very first beneficiary, uh, a few weeks after, we had won the appeal, we had won freedom. I mean, Lady Chatterley trial, freedom for great art. Oz trial, freedom for... Transgressive? Well, school by art for trying, uh, art for uh, not so great art, but for sincere and satirical art. And the very first beneficiary of uh, the Oz, the law that we changed in the Oz appeal was Rupert Murdoch and page three, which appeared in the wake of the Oz acquittal. Made it all worthwhile, really. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Am I right in thinking that the prosecution never suggested at any point that the Oz editors had abused the school children? That, which... No, in, there was no today, evidence of that. No, but in today's climate no. of moral panic over Jimmy Savile and uh, Rolf Harris, that would be the first thing they would have suggested. Oh, I mean, in a way, hasn't the clock, isn't the clock being turned back right now from what was gained by the Oz trial? Well, that's interesting. I think that at least the Oz trial and uh, in the 70s, as I say, Lady Chatterley in 1960 had been uh, the point at which great art was protected from the obscenity laws. Uh, the Oz trial was the point at which uh, not so great art, but genuine art was protected. And it was not till the end of the 1970s in a, John and I defended again a shabby little book called uh, <laughs> Inside Linda Lovelace. And uh, <laughs> the judge told, said to the jury, um, members of the jury, if this book isn't obscene, I don't know what is. And they came back and acquitted after a couple of hours. <laughs> and the DPP announced that he wouldn't uh, prosecute the written word again. So we did have that uh, achievement, I guess, mm -hmm. by the end of the 70s. But now, yes, we do have witch hunts. We do have people and, um, who are being kept, like Paul Gambaccini, uh, arrested and then nothing happens for years. Yeah. They lose their job and in this terrible state of suspense uh, in relation to evidence which is completely non-existent, virtually. Yeah. <laughs>
So, so there is uh, a sense of proportion that we've got to keep while realizing that uh, the, the, you, you have to go after these people. And in my time, in the 70s, uh, I remember in the, the next case, we thought we'd killed off conspiracy to corrupt public morals, but it was brought back for an organization called PI. And I remember the most active member of PI in the committal proceedings was not uh, and the one who wrote the most obscene stuff about child molesting was a guy they pretended uh, his name was Mr. Henderson. And uh, the magistrate uh, was Richard Branson's father, a very, very fair, firm, uh, and principled London magistrate. And if he had known that this was really perverting the course of justice, that the most active member of this organization on the evidence before the court was not Mr. Henderson. That was a pseudonym for Sir Peter Heyman, who was the deputy director of MI6. So there you are. Uh, there was uh, a real element of corruption and cover-up in the courts at that time. And it was by uh, taking on courageously, because they were up against a prison sentence, by dressing up as schoolgirls during the committal proceedings, by calling everyone from uh, George Melly to Marty Feldman, who had a terrible row with the judge. And um, as he went out, he said to Richard and the doc, <coughs> pointing at the judge, he said, boring old fart. <laughs> and uh, this was overheard by a Times reporter who reported it on page one of the Times. And, uh, he said uh, afterwards, Richard said that when they got to prison, they were terrified that because of the way the tabloids had played the trial that they might be beaten up as if they were paedophiles. But uh, they found themselves celebrated. They were rather prison royalty entirely because uh, Marty Feldman had <laughs> called, called, called Judge Argyle, who was the most savage of all sentences, uh, uh, a boring old fart. He had actually, he was the recorder of Birmingham, and whenever anyone vandalized a telephone box in Birmingham, he'd send them down for three years on the grounds that, as he would say, we don't do this sort of thing in Birmingham, uh, which they didn't, but they did it in Coventry. <laughs> Just that, the telephone box vandalism hit the roof in Coventry. <laughs> Did you have a house called Truncheons, by any chance? He did, yes. <laughs> no, that was Milford Stevenson. He was another horror. Charles, do you think you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, the way the music business came behind the, the, the Oz people during the <clears throat> trial? Well, Oz and IT, International Times, the other main... Uh, underground publication, Oz was a magazine, IT was a newspaper, uh, were in a symbiotic relationship with the rock business because essentially they depended on the rock business for, uh, you know, for, the, for an advertising revenue lifeblood. And uh, the, uh, and the, the, rock, the rock business liked to channel you know, certain of its, uh, what they consider to be its more adventurous acts uh, towards the hippies who were the vast majority of the readers of the magazine. And with, uh, w with the advent of the Oz trial, uh, the magazine suddenly got uh, an offer of help from... What, what was probably the single greatest rock and roll luminary in the country, John Lennon. And he said, right, I'm going to do a benefit record to, you know, ra to raise support and uh, funds for Oz. And here's what we're going to do. You know that, uh, you know the mansion that's in the Imagine video? You know, he had, uh, Lennon had a had a studio there, and he said, "Right, I'm going to um, I'm going to write the song. Uh, Phil Spector's going to produce it. 
Ringo's going to play the drums and Yoko is going to do whatever Yoko does. And in, uh, Klaus Vormann was going to play the bass and the deal was right. Anybody in the Oz posse who plays an instrument, thinks they can play an instrument or just wants to uh, shake a bit of percussion a discreet distance away from the mic <laughs> and thinks they can sing a backing vocal at least a quarter in tune, uh, you know, here's where the van's leaving from. And um, I was thinking, right, I'll have, I'll have, a, bit, I'll have a bit of this. Uh, Felix uh, had actually been a drummer in one of his many previous incarnations, so he was, uh, you know, a natural to uh, be in the percussion section. Uh, Rich Richard and Jim sort of sang and sort of played percussion, uh, and you know, I vol I volunteered to play some guitar, and <coughs> you know, we got there, and you know, it was long. Uh, a long drive up the drive, you know, this was not a, this is not a little suburban place, you know, we're talking rock broker belt, we're talking mansion, we're talking place that you probably had to be an international criminal to have afforded in previous times. Uh, there was Lennon, you know, in uh, top to toe Levi's, uh, led us into this uh, wonderfully well appointed, uh, small but perfectly formed studio. Behind the drums was the small but perfectly formed Ringo. Uh, in the control room was the small and not really perfectly formed Phil Spector. <laughs> and, you know, Lennon basically decided who was going to pretend to play what. Uh, and, you know, I had, uh, I had my eye on some of the legendary electric guitars on the wall, you know, there was the, uh, you know, one of the three-quarter size Rickenbackers, there was the uh, Let It Be, you know, the rooftop concert Epiphone, and it was like, uh, and then I'm saying, right, we're starting with acoustic guitars, so I got one of those Gibson J160Es that were, they bought from the music shop in Liverpool in 1962, and Lennon started showing everybody the song. And it had this introduction which involved a particular occurrence of a first position D chord. And I thought, right, I'm going to get clever. We were, all, we were sort of sitting cross-legged with microphones coming down like this. And uh, I thought, right, let, let's, I'm, I'm going to show him I know what I'm doing. So I did this... Uh, a uh, little aug augmented thing at the third fret, and he was, um, none of them cheap folk club tricks in here, Murray. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh my God, John Lennon knows my name. <laughs> and a little, uh, a little later on, I actually broke a string, I was so nervous, and legendary Beatles roadie Mal Evans was hanging around, and Lennon, uh, Len said, not to worry, we'll see if we can get Mal to change the string. Like he wouldn't change the string if he was asked. Then, still nervous, played the wrong chord. Lennon stops the take. I thought, OK, this is where <coughs> the legendary John Lennon viperish scorn is dumped on my teenage head. But he said, no, let's do it again. I made a mistake. He took... Uh, he took responsibility for the mistake, even though he knew quite well th uh, that I'd played it. Later on, when there was actually a basic track down, I was uh, saying, I don't you think this needs some electric guitars on it now? And it was like, all right, Moddy, back in your box. <laughs> and then when the record finally came out, all those acoustic guitars had been taken off Electric guitars have been put on. I thought, bloody rock stars, bloody John Lennon, bloody Phil Spector. They should have listened to me. <laughs> but the guy I really felt sorry for was the guy who'd been brought along to sing lead vocals. His lead vocal was taken off and replaced by somebody uh, who Lennon knew, who none of us had ever heard of. And the punchline was that they took so long to... Um, 
to mix it that by the time it actually came out, the trial was over. <laughs> It was called God Save Oz. It was indeed. It was a bit of a dirge. It was a and the B-side was, was called Do the Oz. Do the Oz, yes. That was Yoko's. <laughs> yeah. Never heard of it. <laughs> Very few people have. <laughs> Mick Jagger also denoted uh, a song subsequently, his famous Cocksucker Blues. Oh, the one he used to get to out of get the get out of his record contract. contract. He, he was an amazing... He would have been a great lawyer. He... Uh, <laughs> EMI, I think it was. Uh, Decker. Try, Decker wouldn't uh, release this uh, amazing song. And uh, no, he wouldn't. He, what? No, he what? wanted to change, and he looked at his contract, and he noticed that there was a, an undertaking by the record company to, um, to release every song that he, um, he gave them. And so he said, right, release this. I'm a lonely schoolboy lost in London, it begins. And it is an extraordinary uh, It was song. a solo performance yeah. with acoustic guitar. Yeah, it, and they didn't release it. Did it ever get issued? It's been widely bootlegged. Huh. Amazing. Never heard it. But, he but you don't like the Stones anyway, yeah. Rob. <laughs> not, even a, not even the solo performance with an acoustic guitar. No electric instruments involved. A bit of, cr bit of hiss and crackle. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Got to hear it. So, Robert, did you, when all this was going on, when a piece, somebody's riff on a bit of your artwork yeah. was bringing the British establishment to its knees, did you know anything about this? Barely. Barely knew anything about it. Nobody contacted me. They, finally, I saw some article about it, and they, they didn't mention my name. I so I. I wasn't even sure that whose artwork they were talking about. We called Felix Topolsky. He was the artist who defended your work, or defended the Rupert Bear cartoon, and he got into a long controversy with the prosecutor over whether it was art. Um, right. is, is, the, the question went, is art, uh, is Rupert, as he appears in the Rupert Annual, is that art? No, it's not. <laughs> is art, but, so just putting the head of the bear onto Mr. Crumb's yeah. drawing, uh, does that make it art? Yes. What sort of art does it make it? Satirical art. And so it went on and on like this. But we spent several days uh, <laughs> defending your artistic merit well, because that was the defense. You could run to an obscenity charge. You could but, you call know, when you experts. Have to, when you have to explain satire to people, you know, they just don't get it. They never will. It's hopeless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Either so, get it or they don't. And actually very few people really or enjoy satire, it's kind of a special thing. Well, it was very difficult, because with Felix Topolsky was, uh, had difficulty uh, explaining what was art and what wasn't. It's the sort of question that a cross-examiner can tie you up in. But we had called um, <laughs> Edward de Bono, and uh, the cross-examination went... Um, it was the lateral thinking expert, and uh, cross-examination went, uh, Mr. de Bono, why do you think Rupert is equipped with such a large size organ? <laughs> to which she said, I'm sorry, I'm not very up to date with bears. Um, <laughs> what size do you think would be natural? <laughs> to which the judge said, you must not ask counsel questions. <laughs> and so we, uh, th this was the kind of dialogue that went on day in and day out. So with unbelievable. The British Surreal. experts. So as Incredible. for uh, Gilbert, you, we had, or well, the kids had chosen uh, one of their favourite Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers cartoons, which is where Frat, Fat Freddy was yeah, it's sent, in here. sent to rip off Park, which I guess may well be the story you told us about. Uh, no, was, that's was that Central Park? <laughs> and anyway, he gets sent to rip off Park and he gets mugged. Having scored uh, uh, a whole lot of drugs, he then gets them taken from him, and so he's deprived. Um, and there's a sort of moral at the end of the story. But that was alleged to encourage readers to take drugs, and uh, I would have thought the adverse, we argued, that it had just the opposite effect if the cartoon were taken seriously. There's this other strip by me that they printed in here I, that ends with a, uh, a guy getting a blowjob from a girl, and they didn't seem to notice, I think, because the 
color is so confusing mm. and people were on LSD that did the color job that you can hardly tell what's going on. I guess. And, there were no ba and there were no bears involved. Mm -hmm. right. you know, no, no. no nursery favorite bears. Yeah. Wasn't there a copyright thing on both the bear and the and your work as well. I mean, well, I mean the, looking back on it, it's just shocking that all your material, I think, was just taken. Wasn't, it? Wasn't, well, it? wasn't that yeah, underground press? The underground press, press yeah. but didn't the, believe well, in copyright at that stage. It was stage. kind of a, soon a tacit agreement mind. that anybody in, the, in these hippie underground papers, nobody was making any money, so everybody let just let them use whatever they wanted all over the place. And, you, you know, it was just flattering to see your work in print, you know. So nobody cared that people took your stuff and printed and all over the place. I think the idea was, you know, anything, anything uh, for anything. And of course, some some publications had lots of stuff that everybody wanted. Other publications had absolutely nothing yeah. that anybody right. wanted right. at all. Yeah. It was a wacky period, all right. <laughs> but this was a period of political repression. I mean, the, the miners were starting to strike. There were three days a week we That's were in right. darkness. And it's often forgotten that uh, the 60s, while we look back on them as the flower power era, were actually very repressive. <coughs> a lot they of were... assassinations in the US. Mm. Well, in Britain, the police were planting <coughs> bricks on protesters against the Greek embassy, and they were beating the, suspects the, the with Vietnam rhino war. whips. The, uh, the Vietnam War, the huge was... Vietnam mm. demonstrations in uh, Grosvenor Square. But was, but barely noticed any of that material. I mean, it was, it was about sunshine and having a good time. It wasn't actually interesting in politics. Well, the Martin Sharp yeah, sure. cartoons on LBJ were okay, okay, perhaps okay. the most savage. They were you know, more savage than Gerald Scarf in a way. Hmm. It was a very visual magazine hmm. also. It, the words sort of took second place to everything else. Well, you've become uh, a great design guru. Could you uh, I, tell I, me I, honestly? Is that actionable? <laughs> <laughs> Could you Everything tell me everyone. honestly now what did you think of what do you think of the design of Oz when you look back on it? Has it left any legacy at all? Well, I think that issue was not the most beautiful one. You yourself <laughs> it said that, that, it, that I mean the kind of psychedelia of um, Martin and John were, were just extraordinary. It's what um, appeared on some of the early Cream albums, and to me that's a very powerful memory of that particular time, and and more distinctively Oz as well, because as we said, the thing about underground magazines that time was wherever you were in the world, you were an underground magazine if you had Sheldon and Crumb in it without really making the best possible use of it. Whereas I think some of those um, psychedelic covers were remarkable. It's quite interesting, the next time I saw Sheldon and Crumb in this context <coughs> was in the mid 80s in Czechoslovakia and the Samizdat material, so much of it huh. was like really? Oz and-, right. and uh, Really? Yeah. Huh. I had no idea. But you know those underground papers we used to, on paste up night, people would just take LSD. Hey, the colors, let's do some, put some more color on here, man, wow. And it's just become incoherent kind of. Orange thing. reversed out of red, yeah, yeah. man. And like here's this red type with this blue drawing be printed behind it, it's, oh, huh, what? And you can't tell what the hell's going on half the time. Richard <laughs> Neville used to say, if you can't read it, you're too old. <laughs> <laughs> then he confessed that being over 30, he couldn't read all of it himself. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, all these papers were kind of long-winded. They had long tirades about, you know, the establishment and stuff. They weren't very well written often, but like I said, it was... There was some... Uh, I, I mean, it is normal to see in obscenity trials, they'll take the worst example or the least good example. I mean, Lady Chatterley was perhaps... One of Lawrence's uh, worst books, and uh, Oz 28 was perhaps the least impressive. Uh, and Oz had a number, it had Robert Hughes, it had Germaine Greer, uh, they wrote extraordinary pieces, and of course Martin Sharp's cartoons, Charles's precocious music reviews. Yeah, but I only came, uh, came in with, uh, with, you know, this one, Oz 28, but uh, afterwards, uh, Felix said, you know, do you want to stick around and do more stuff? And, you know, I thought I was being sent, you know, having had my little adventure, that, you know, I was going to be sent is. back to the prov 
18 uh, years old. <laughs> sent, sent back to the provinces to rot, but, you know, really what I laughingly refer to uh, as my career started with this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughingly referred to and, career. Uh, your career. Could I have your review? I just find the phrase that uh, sent the prosecution up the wall. Where is your... Could you find your review? Well, it's, uh, it, it's not a complete issue. It may not actually be in there. Edited highlights. Edited highlights, <laughs> yes. I think maybe at this point we could ask if there are a couple of questions from the audience for anyone on the panel. No? Okay, we're out. Speak! <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Peter Popham. He went to the Independent. Uh, Charles Shaw Murray. You did Jeff Beck. Mm. You know, this mm. was uh, really, as John Peel said, it was state of the art. You were... Uh, question over here. It's a question over there. Um, I've got a question for Robert and Gilbert about living in France. Um, why do you feel you've settled there? And, you know, I just wonder what your life, the rhythm of your life, your lives are like there. Oh, we go to the cafe, we drink some wine. <laughs> <laughs> So, so your grandchildren, are, they live close. Existentialism and <laughs> situationism. <laughs> and instead of saying I work in the publishing business, I can say, je suis un de senator de bande dessinée. <laughs> That's better than I can talk it. <laughs> no, she has her. Um, this is a tremendously facile question, given that we've just had a wonderful hour learning about obscenity and uh, well, other tremendous topics. Um, this is for Mr. Crum. What do you, what, when, when you were young, what, oh, nice, lovely, that's good. When you were young, what did you most enjoy about those Donald Duck comic books? Oh, oh thank there you. There was this, I don't know if you are aware of Carl Barks. Mm. He's a great storyteller. The good artist. You know, and it was, we called him the good artist because we didn't know his name in the 50s. And as a kid in the 50s and being a child of pop culture, you know, that was surrounded by television and comic books and, and that was it. You know, I, I didn't know anything else. And it was the best of what was available for kids at that time. It was the best entertainment that, that there was. And he could do great action when Donald Duck had a temper fit he would be thrashing around and jumping in the air. Yeah, he was great. <laughs> I was very flattered years later when somebody showed him one of my comics and took a photo of him looking at one of my comics and laughing. <laughs> it practically brought tears to my eyes. Carl Bark lived to be 100 years old. Um, question, I think, I think this question's for Jeffrey, probably. I'm intrigued to hear, and I've heard it again this evening, that some of the school kids appeared as defense witnesses and some appeared as prosecution witnesses. Is, is that correct, and how did that work out? No, only one, Viv Berger, was... But a number of them, I think, were threatened as prosecution witnesses. Um, I saw you all, didn't I? Took yeah. statements from you, and... Um, uh, we were minded to call you, but I think for your own protection, we didn't. Um, I don't think it was because we thought you were unreliable <laughs> or uh, anything of that sort. The one problem we had was with Germaine Greer, because uh, she would have made a brilliant witness, and actually she was fabulous for Nasty Tales. And that's right. The following year, she, she got it off. And uh, single-handedly, uh, as as the uh, defence witness, but and I wanted to uh, have her do this, do it for us. And unfortunately, because of British tax laws at the time, you had to spend a year outside Britain uh, to to make any money. In her case, on the female unit, and so here she was, is stuck in an American university. And I said, you know, the we are in danger of 
having them sent to prison. And uh, she said, well, look, if it comes to that, I will forfeit all the money I made on the female eunuch and fly back. Uh, I said, I'll look at other things. I tried to get the BBC to do a video link so that she could appear in the old Bailey uh, from New York. But that didn't work out. And uh, the final decision was made uh, because there was in Suck, on the front cover of Suck magazine, Suck. Uh, which was shown, it was on the wall of the obscene <coughs> publication squad, yeah. uh, is Germaine yeah. with her legs between, well, her face between her legs, That's but right. uh, with her uh, anus extremely open on the front cover. And so we had to make a quick calculation uh, that uh, the jury would perhaps be more affected uh, when this was put to her in cross-examination <laughs> than, than her defense. But you've got to understand, this was the last jury that was, had a property qualification and was overaged because the jury, at, at that time, you had to own property to sit on a jury. So the juries were mainly male, middle class, middle aged, uh, it, the 21 and over. And um, I remember the night before the trial started, we were all round in Palace Gardens Terrace thinking we got the list, the names and occupations of the jurors. And we were hoping for a graphic designer or, or a, an actor or a, a cartoonist. A cartoonist would be right. And they were all in, in hard hats from E15. They were all builders, laborers, and uh, they were all over, over 50. And uh, there was one, I remember one guy I noticed, his name was George Blake. So everybody said, yes, we have to have George Blake, no matter how old or, or and hostile he looks. And George Blake the next day looked so hostile that we, we had to challenge him. But the jury was, the stretch of the, was um, in the, the average age was about 60. Uh, Not exactly the, peers of the people. Exactly, the and that was another problem with the Oz trial. But um, yeah. it was, it, looking back on it, it wasn't just a cover-up for the obscene publications squad. There was a Tory, new Tory government, a determination to destroy the underground press. And there was an extraordinary sexual ignorance that we struck particularly in the Court of Appeal, because there was a little box, you <coughs> won't see it there, uh, with a quote from Suck magazine uh, about a technique using, I think, hot coffee and ice cubes, you remember, Dick? But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, probably but Hippocrates. No, it wasn't Dr. Hippocrates, it was, it was the small act. And um, it, uh, the Chief Justice, Lord Widgery, of the Widgery report in fame, had uh, couldn't believe that this wasn't obscene because it showed the joys from the woman's perspective, he said, of oral sex. It wasn't just that it described oral sex, it showed that it was women would get pleasure out of it. And this was unforgivable. And <laughs> we, and quite seriously, we had we, the three-day appeal and we thought we'd won it, and then Widgery started to talk like this. How we'll have to apply the proviso. Even if you win the appeal, the court could apply the proviso, which said if there's been no miscarriage of justice, uh, it can uphold, it can uh, refuse the appeal. So at 12 o'clock, they rose with Widgery kept saying, we have to apply the proviso because this, ha this is, must be obscene because it shows that women can enjoy oral sex. <laughs> and um, if three hours later they came back uh, and there was no talk of the proviso, the appeal was upheld. And I found out later what had happened. One of the judges was Nigel Bridge, who had been in the Navy and was quite broad-minded and had a clerk who had been an able seaman. And he sent him down to Soho to collect, in the lunch hour, to collect uh, uh, the run-of-the-mill uh, Soho porn that was on offer. 
and he brought it back and they spent a couple of hours perusing it and realizing that uh, Lord Widgery was living in another century. And so, <laughs> so that is why the proviso was not applied. But there was an extraordinary degree of, of sexual ignorance and sexism, actually. Well, you know, for years later, when uh, Tony Bennett's knockabout press was importing mm. comics from the States, stuff mm. of mine and other people's, that Her Majesty's Customs would confiscate the books and destroy them because the customs officials had the power to decide themselves at the moment that they, that they inspected the books if they were obscene to the customs officials, they could then take yeah. them and destroy them. And no, I defended a lot of your books in customs in well, you know, odd you. places like South <laughs> Southampton Magistrates Court, yeah. where you wouldn't know about it, but yeah. some distributor would send them over, and the customs would seize them, and yeah. instead of and they'd go before a local magistrate. Yeah, uh, I defended them once with Gilroy and uh, Rowlandson books, who had, which had also been seized by customs. Really? Yeah. <laughs> And Tony wow. Bennett, of course, was um, prosecuted at yeah. the Old Bailey yeah, for yeah. in '84, I think. '84. I, uh, I defended him. It was for uh, pu pu publishing a book called "How to Grow Marijuana Indoors Under Lights," <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'd used some illustrations of yours. This was said to be depraving and corrupting, and we had. Endless arguments from experts who came in from Wales and said that uh, that smoking dope was uh, a depraved and corrupted activity. <coughs> so the obscenity laws would cover it, but we succeeded yeah. in uh, rejecting that. And uh, so. Well, he he told me that if he published stuff of mine himself in England, and it didn't have to be anywhere near the customs place, that he could get away with it. But if it came through customs from the outside, and these customs officials had the power to decide themselves. That That's right. This is, we eventually won because of the European court, because we became part oh. of Europe. Yeah. There was a rubber sex doll that had been imported from Germany, and the customs <laughs> had blown her up and then seized her. <laughs> and, and, a controlled explosion. And, and destroyed her. But the European court solemnly held that because there were rubber sex dolls being made in Britain, which couldn't be blown up and uh, destroyed, yeah. then it was discriminatory, and it was a great, <laughs> it was a great victory. And after that, they had to uh, make the test the same, and the customs could no longer seize things and destroy them because they were indecent. They, they had to, obscenity was the uh, test, not indecency. Hmm. How worried were the three about actually spending a very long time in jail? Oh, look, they, they, they were really, they were very courageous, I think, uh, because they knew we spelled out to them, at least I did, the uh, dangers of Judge Argyle, the dangers of judges like Widgery, uh, and they could have spent a long time in prison. Uh, they were, and, and they would never, Richard had this thing about gay rights, understandably enough, but it wasn't fully lawful homosexuality in 1971. There were no gay MPs, no one was coming out. And he insisted on having Warren Haig, uh, who was an incredibly camp guy, in the well of the court, disporting himself before the jury. And he was saying, I've got to do it as to, be, um, to make a point about uh, gay rights, because they'd had a, a gay Oz. But uh, it obviously would upset the jurors, because those things did in 1970. We're back uh, in the semi-dark ages. And um, when, of course, it was an amazing story. Um, when we applied for bail, the judge, who was the newest, youngest judge, uh, high court judge, and of course there'd been nothing but stuff about Oz in the press, for and against the mail and so on, were totally hostile. And on the Friday, he said, well, I hear what you say. It's very un unusual to grant bail pending appeal, but I will think about it over the weekend, which meant he was going to read the editorials in the Sunday papers. And uh, anyway, on Monday morning, uh, John and I, John was sitting in the front row, which was reserved for QCs, and I was sitting behind him. And uh, the judge was about to come out, and the judge's door opened. And an extraordinarily beautiful young woman in denim 
came out of the judge's door and walked down and sat beside John. And John said, uh, I don't think the, this is counsel's bench. I don't think the judge would like you sitting there. i never forget, she looked up and she said, I don't think Dad will mind. <laughs> and she came, the judge came out and with his daughter's eye upon him, uh, gave them bail. And uh, I think that there was something in the Bob Dylan song about <laughs> your sons and your daughters are not beyond your command in some houses they do command. And uh, perhaps in that one they did. So there, it was a real intergenerational clash, I think. It yeah. was part of the losing of faith, along with Vietnam, yeah. in the older generation. <clears throat> there was a parallel case in California, uh, art gallery owner in Berkeley, California, had an art exhibit of the artwork from Snatch Comics, which is clearly obscene. If that's not obscene, nothing is obscene. But obscenity isn't against the law in California. Pornography is. <clears throat> but the law in California, and this case went to a jury trial, the law says that pornography needs to be a prurient interest, and no one on the jury would admit to being sexually aroused by <laughs> Snatch Comics, and uh, so they were, he was acquitted, Cy Lowenski. <laughs> it, it's not erotic, it's emetic. <laughs> I think we have time for one more uh, audience question. We've got a gentleman here. Uh, can we get a, a mic for this gentleman, please? Um, in the 50s, in the States, you bought one from the post on a Sunday, there'd be two colour supplements of comics. Nothing like that over here. Has anything changed? Is America still very keen on comics, but the UK isn't? I, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> Steve it's a Bell's different world good. now. It's yeah, 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 the yeah. Same when, world. when you were a child, you bought the Sunday newspaper, there'd be eight or ten supplements, two eight. of which would be comics. Certainly the Washington Post was like that. Never seen anything like that in this country. And this seems to be that America loves comics, but this country does not. Has that changed? Well, and also, why do you think that difference occurs? Well, it's, a, it's a different world now. I mean, it's, comics have, have not, a newspaper doesn't even have the prominence that it did back then, let alone the Sunday comics. Sunday comics now in America is a big nothing. But you now comics are this special category of graphic novels and all, and it has its own kind of, it's not no longer the big mainstream media thing that it was in the 50s, things have really changed a lot. As for England, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I saw the exhibit today and I saw lots of stuff I'd never seen before because I'd never seen in America and I, I didn't, wasn't aware that there was so much comic action in, in this country over the last few decades. I was kind of surprised to see that. But you think England that people don't aren't that interested in comics in this country? You think? I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Those comics um, are hugely more. popular in in mm. France. I, don't know. I just wanted to go back to the um, the school kids in court question. You mentioned Vivian Berger did end up in court. Was was he used by the prosecution? I'm yes, he was. That. He was. But I mean, he didn't. All, all he did was to say that he, uh, as I recall it, uh, that well, What's his it? mother certainly was called, uh, but she was president of the National Council of Civil Liberties, so we weren't uh, weren't worried about her. But there was no. I don't. I think. Gosh, there was a statement from Viv, but I don't think he was actually called. I think it was his mother, and we called her. I think the only... Um, what about this 15-year-old girl that was in here? This, uh, what's her name? Uh, 
Bertie Aldershot or something like that? Mm. But no, Aldershot's years? her hometown. Oh. So it's Bertie, comma, Aldershot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like jail bait of the month here. 15 mm. years old. You're right. Nowadays, they would have thrown him all in jail just for this. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they, they'd, ne they'd never see the light of day again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's now, see. I mean, it, and it was a, it, what, that photo uh, was a deliberate homage to your yeah. Honey Bunch Kaminsky. That's right, yeah. Jail who was jail blown up to about 14 feet and led the parade of the Oz supporters on day one to the Old Bay. 15, well. they're child molesters. Lock them up. They still sit in jail nowadays. <laughs> right, Time's I think chill. that's about all we have time for. I... Right. Let's, let's just pay tribute to Felix Dennis. Uh, he was... Indeed. He was so extraordinary. I never forget the judge, uh, having sent Richard to jail for 15 months and uh, then Jim, I think, for 12, turned to Felix and said, I'm only giving you nine months because you are the youngest and you are very much less intelligent. <laughs> and Felix lived with this in order to go on to make uh, be a multimillionaire. But it was uh, the question is whether they were worried about prison. Yes, of, of course they were worried initially about because there was a lot of rape in prison at that time, and Richard was particularly nervous. And uh, he, after putting on a brave face for a week or so, he saw me um, the night before. He said, "You've got to get me out." And I said, uh, "Why exactly?" And he said. I can't stand the smell of Felix's socks. <laughs> they were all in a cell, overcrowded cell together. And of course, a couple of years later, Oz finally bit the dust. Felix and I set up a small company to publish underground comics, and we called it H Bunch Associates. That's right. In a tribute to your character. And years later, Felix invited me and Aileen to come to his private island. <laughs> <laughs> he said he had a staff of ten people there to, to, you know, serve our needs if we wanted to come. We never did go, though. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you, Robert, Gilbert, Charles, Dan, Jeffrey, for coming along and giving us a very, very entertaining account of the Oz trial. And please give them a round of applause.